and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. Don't you think about Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I don't know if you know this, but June is Alzheimer's and Brain Health Awareness as well. Today, we're going to be doing an open mic where everyone around the world is welcome to participate with us and tell us what they're up to, the good, the bad, the ugly, what we need, what's working, what's not, from personal stories to uh, lines of products, services, and tools that can help ease people on the dementia journey. So um, I know you will find this very interesting. A few people have called ahead to let me know they're coming on and I'm really, really excited to talk with them. But before I introduce you to everyone, I always like to just uh, encourage people to go to alzheimerspeaks.com. You know, my mom lived with dementia for 30 years and I've been curating content since 2009. So there's all different types of things that you can participate in. You can read, you can watch, you can listen to, um, you can learn. So again, go to alzheimerspeaks.com and check out our free educational resources. I'm also, of course, available for for keynotes and speaking and training and things like that. Um, But again, today we are really going to focus on all the wonderful things that are out there uh, to support you through dementia. And one of those things is called Twiddle. Uh, Twiddle is a great sensory product that can help people struggling with anxiety or sundowning. They also have a product called adapt wrap which um, can help both care partners as well as those living with dementia when dressing starts to become an obstacle. So go to the number four and then twiddlesplural.com, for twiddles.com uh, to learn more about their sensory products as well as the adapter wrap. And then, of course, I always want to mention Dementia Map, which is our global resource directory. There are tons of free um, resources there. We have over 150 categories listed, people can search. And we have not bought lists. This is, we are growing this word of mouth because we want people listed there. Uh, We want to know they're going to respond to your needs. And so I think you'll be shocked at the creativity and the people who have walked this path, who have stepped up and stepped out to help the next people in line. So check out again, dementiamap.com. Not only is it a resource directory, but there's great articles. There's a glossary of terms and there is also a calendar of event. And if you are interested in participating in that, if you have a service product tool that you want to share, that's easily done. Um, you can just click the button when you go to the homepage or you can you know, reach out to me and I'm more than glad to give you a virtual tour and explain all about the program there. So with no further ado, let's see who's here today. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Open Mic. I am so thrilled at our turnout today and we might have others popping in. This is a very informal Uh, casual space to be your authentic self and share how you are shifting dementia care from crisis to comfort around the world. And we definitely have a variety of people on the show today. So I'm going to have everybody just briefly introduce themselves. And then we're going to go one at a time and kind of dive a little bit deeper. And they're going to highlight what they what they have to offer and uh, why you should participate and uh, connect with them and share their information. So Brenda, I'm going to start with you if you don't mind. Sure. I'm Brenda Freed, and I am the co-creator with Alder Allensworth of McKenzie Meets Alzheimer's. Wonderful. And it's an awareness program. Thank you. Amy? I'm Amy House. I'm the creator and host of the podcast Think Dementia, and also director of memory care for Silvercrest Properties, and some volunteer things that I'm sure Lori will bring up. Yep. Yeah, just a few. Yeah. <laughs> Amy and I have worked together a lot for the uh, 
Roseville Alzheimer's AD group, which is doing fascinating work. And Sue, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about you? My name is Sue Ryan. And I'm the founder of the Caregiver's Journey, walking people through their entire caregiving journey from when it's on the horizon through moving forward after it's ended. And my partner is Nancy Treister. So Nancy, why don't you go next? Uh, As Sue said, we are partnered up on the caregiver's journey. We're focused specifically on uh, caregivers uh, caring for people with dementia. Okay, thank you. And Morgan? Hi, I'm Morgan Vance. I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives and Advancement for the Pat Summit Foundation, a nonprofit that is uh, working specifically in the Alzheimer's disease space. Thank you. And Lori? Good morning. Um, hi, I'm Lori Beatty, and uh, I work with uh, Wendy Hall with, for Dementia Doulas International. Thank you. And Wendy? Hi, I'm Wendy, Wendy Hall, um, founder, managing director of Dementia Doulas International, and yeah, I work with Lori here in Australia. Yeah, well, we, we are thrilled that you're with us. I know it's like 3 a.m. over there, you know, for us here in the U.S. Uh, you know, for me, it's only one o'clock in the afternoon. So <laughs> I, I was so appreciative when you said, hey, I'll stay up. You know, <laughs> I want to be part of this. So so thank you for um, for participating today. I'm going to go, uh, Wendy, to you and Lori first, because if you guys want to roll off and go to bed, we understand that. <laughs> and, and I know our audience will, too. They all know how in important sleep is uh, when it comes to uh, caregiving and uh, living with dementia. So Wendy, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the Dementia Doulas International? Yeah, so thank you so much for having me, us, on, uh, I was going to say this morning. Um, Yeah, so Dementia Doulas International started uh, officially five years ago uh, after 10 years uh, in the making. Um, I have a clinical background. I had a lot of frustrations in the clinical setting uh, working with people with dementia as far as how much the system, I guess, was letting, you know, letting them down in so many ways and families were not coming along for the ride. Um, And so over the last 10 years, Laurie and I have certainly uh, worked together in different roles, a lot of community-based programs, and really wanted to create not just another program, another training program, um, but something tangible that could really stand up and make a difference in the lives of families. And so after a lot of research, the Dementia Doula role was created. And yeah, we, we sort of haven't looked back from there. So a role that gives families some consistency from pre-diagnosis through to time of bereavement. We just felt that families were really left hanging. They were meeting new faces and new environments at a time where they were just craving stability and needing a familiar face and and so um yeah it it was something that um we knew there was a need uh we just really wanted to make a difference in that space and ultimately ensure that families were still there as a united front um at end of life for people with dementia and we still i think strongly believe that and see that People with dementia are still dying alone, surrounded by a lot of people, and we want to change that experience and be a part of that. So, um, again, after a lot of research, the dementia doula role was something we could craft and, and ensure that, that that would be the case. So a lot of people might not know what a, what a doula actually does. You know, how does it differ from hospice? You know, is there any correlation? So why don't, why don't we mm. let our audience know the differences there and the correlations? Um, that you have yeah with. yeah um well i'm not sure in america but i'm thinking because we do actually have um some students uh, so dementia doulas international we train and educate and support our dementia doulas in their practice so here in australia as in a lot of cases uh, in the world people with dementia aren't entitled to hospice services um it's kind of deemed that they're already in care so uh it they don't need anything else specialized and so what the dementia doula role was about was we crafted it on the end of life doula model so someone being of service someone in a non-clinical role that could advocate and and again provide that uh, the extra stuff, the the compassionate care. When when we were first developing this model, in my mind, I could really clearly see three big tick boxes, and 
clinical care was was already covered, personal care was already covered, and compassionate care just sucked. It was something that staff in any setting could do if there was time. It was kind of deemed to be the nice to do stuff, but there's never time. And we wanted to raise the profile of compassionate care and ensure that that people with dementia were having that same experience that anyone else is entitled to with a life-limiting uh, condition. And so while the end-of-life doula model um, was was close, it wasn't close enough. And, and, and the, the complexities, as we know, the long trajectory with dementia meant that there needed to be a specialised uh, role dedicated to uh, compassionate care at a leadership level. So someone that was a voice piece for not only families, uh, but the person themselves and really enabling and empowering families to play a more active role in care. Which I think is so important because, you know, we have ambiguous loss with dementia, little pieces, you know, that's constantly changing. And I love that you support the, the patient and the families and friends through it because they're all coming from different pieces and we all grieve differently. We all process differently and so I have had quite a few doulas on the show over the years because I think it's a really important piece. And it's one my mom who, you know, lived with dementia for 30 years. She was always very adamant about death and dying and, you know, allowing the respect and dignity and compassion that goes with it and trying to remove the fear of it, um, which I see you guys having a big role in too, in terms of understanding and meeting people at their level. That's what I've always heard about death doulas. Um, Lori, I'm going to pull you in because you guys work together. And I know you had mentioned, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that you were in Wisconsin and um, had found out about Alzheimer's Speaks kind of when, she, when you were in the States. Is that correct? Um, yes and no. Um, <laughs> I don't even know how I found you. I found you uh, quite a few years ago. Um, that's why I was born in Wisconsin, lived in Wisconsin, and I've moved over to Australia. Um, and I guess one of the things, I may not speak as eloquently as Wendy does at this time, but I'm going to give it a crack. Um, <laughs> the other thing that we were also noticing is here in Australia that there were so many really um, skilled and passionate care workers, professional care workers, and nurses that were just leaving the industry because they were so fed up. And Wendy and I would sit and talk and go, oh, my gosh, this can't keep happening. They, the, you know, the, the, the whole point, as Wendy illustrated before, was that nobody ever has time. And they wanted to have the time. They wanted to sit with, you know, people living with dementia and their family members. Because family members, especially like in care, would come in and really look distraught because they, they they couldn't find ways to connect with their family member or, you know, just coming in day after day and not seeing a lot of changes. So that, that was one of my passions as to why I wanted to see something get up and running was just seeing so many beautiful and passionate people leaving and where were they going? What were they doing? And so it's been really interesting, the types of students that we've been attracting and in the very beginning, it was like, oh, gosh, we, we weren't quite sure who, who we'd attract. But we are attracting very skilled um, individuals who either want to enhance what they're already doing or um, they just want to get back into it and go, oh, I now can take the time to, to spend with family members, um, ideally with people living with dementia, but in particular family members. Yeah, I think here in the in the states too, we have gotten so task oriented and micromanaging, and and we have stripped the purpose out of the jobs. You know, that was the glue that to me held it together. And I've you know I've been in healthcare pretty much all of my life, and and it was like wow, when you get micromanaged like that and turn everything into a task, um, you lose so much. You lose your teams. You you lose the work ethic. I mean, there's just so many different levels and you lose the, I think the, the dignity and care, which is absolutely critically important. And um, so I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, how do people get a hold of you? Yeah. So uh, you can 
uh, find us on at dementia doulas international um, dot com dot au so we're easy to access and um, yeah my books are on there as well my book the dementia doula actually is doing really well in the US so it's really lovely to see uh, that that I guess that global we're on the same page regardless of where we are and that's the wonderful thing to be able to bring everyone together and have that international exposure so that we can all um, contribute. So, yeah, dementiadoulasinternational.com.au and, yeah, we would love to, yeah, hear from people. If anyone here is not on Dementia Map, I would really encourage you, you know, um, becoming a member. There's, you know, we have free and we've got paid things and we don't care how you come in. Our goal is to connect people to services, products and tools and to be able to raise awareness, not only through the resource directory, but through articles you can write, Um, There's ways to advertise, there's an events calendar, there's all different types of things in terms of trying to reduce the cost, reduce the struggle of how do you connect with people and how do they find you in a safe fashion? Um, So I'll just give that a plug because again, I, that's been a dream of mine for 40 years. And, you know, I'm so thankful to Dave Wiedrich when, when he and I partnered up during COVID to pull that together. But you know, it's just critically important for us to work together and to share the knowledge as we're learning even today of what is happening. I always ask our our audience to be a giver of hope, you know, like, click and share. It costs you no money. It takes little time, but you can have a big impact on someone's life by sharing practical, authentic, compassionate, everyday um services, products, and tools. And not everybody needs the same things that, you know, we all need different things at different times and that's perfectly okay. Um, Anything else that you wanted to add before I go on to our next person, Lori, I'll go back to you. Well, actually, I was just thinking of something that, uh, gosh, I'm going to say it was about four years ago. I was back in Minneapolis um, because my brother, uh, my oldest brother was dying and he had vascular, uh, vascular dementia. And I would be contacting Wendy in the middle of the night going, oh my gosh, I can't believe what's happening here because, you know, just little things in the, in the hospital setting. And I'm like, they're asking him questions that he clearly does not understand. But the way that they were asking the questions was what they would traditionally ask any patient in, um, in the hospital. And I said, there's a big disconnect here. And then, and then I take some of the, the, the beautiful staff aside and I just I couldn't help myself, but again, trying to help educate a, a wee bit about about dementia and about what might be happening to him and what I could see was happening to him. And and I, I remember, you know, saying to me, gosh, I don't understand why, you know, why is this happening? Why aren't, you know, I just assumed a lot of things. And um, I guess I find out a lot of stuff just by my personal um, experiences, whether I'm in an emergency room setting or where I find myself, and I'm just observing what's uh, what's occurring um, with the care that people living with dementia are, are having or getting. At least, um, and and that was one instant in the U.S., but I see it all over here, you know, different times. Well, and that is so important. That's one of the things. Again, I love by these conversations, like Norm's McNamara and his Purple Angel, you know, project. Just a simple simple um, graphic with a globe and an angel that people all around the world are using costs no money takes no time but what I love about it 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 gets people asking what is that and now it's their idea to have this conversation it's not being forced on them and they're intrigued by it and they're intrigued how it works and um, you know all of those things are are critical or you know Gary LeBlanc who started the the hospital wristband program going in and educating people in the hospital of, you know, just adding that symbol so people know if they're getting a blood draw or whatever it is. Oh, you know what? I probably shouldn't give this person their discharge information. I need somebody else in the room with them, you know, simple things that are just overlooked all the time and make such a huge, huge difference. Well, um, Wendy, anything else that you wanted to add? No, I think we've covered it uh, well and truly. Just thank you for having us. Well, great. And if you ladies want to go crawl in bed because it's 3 a.m. over there, feel (laughs) free. But you're more than welcome to stay with us as well. So thank thank you. you. Thank you for your time. Thank Thank you for the work that you're doing and bringing this, you know, global um, effort 
to the world. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. If people have not experienced um, death in a positive way and really want to, you need to hook up with a doula, have a conversation. Um, it's life changing. You know, we're, we're, none of us are getting out of here alive. So we might as well learn how to deal with this and, um, and heal during the process. And uh, that's really, really important. So thank you. Um, I'm going to go next to Brenda. Brenda, why don't you tell us what, what the heck you are up to these days in your organization? Thanks so much for having me. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I am a co-creator of Mackenzie Meets Alzheimer's Awareness Program and Mackenzie Meets Alzheimer's Disease Picture Book, along with Alder Allensworth. And the uh, Mackenzie Meets Alzheimer's Awareness Program is a video digital multicultural program. It is available on our website, MackenzieMeetsAlzheimer's.com, and it consists of five videos. What is Alzheimer's disease? Mild stage Alzheimer's disease, moderate stage Alzheimer's disease, severe stage Alzheimer's disease, and coping with Alzheimer's disease for the responsible adult with children. We are targeting the sandwich generation, those who are raising children or have children in the home 18 and under, as well as caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's or any type of dementia. And um, in the videos about the stages, we talk about, uh, we, we offer information about each stage and tips for talking to children and incorporating them into the care. And also uh, we give activities to do. So we like to say that we are a package of videos that are concise, yet comprehensive and can serve families from diagnosis through the severe stage as a basis of what's going to happen. Um, the videos are quite short because they're meant for uh, children and everyone's short attention span at this time. <laughs> um, the truth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, they can be watched, you know, one by one, uh, the videos for the children range, uh, the longest one is 11 minutes, and they range from 6 to 11 minutes. The one for adults is 26 minutes because uh, it incorporates everything, telling adults how to uh, talk to children and giving lots of examples. And basically, it's an overall view of what's in the other videos. It comes with a, um, a quick... Uh, reference guide because we didn't want people to have to take notes. We wanted them to just be able to watch the videos. And even though they're intended for children, they're informational for adults as well. So uh, the quick reference guide just outlines the major points in the, each video. So uh, people can have that at their fingertips. It also comes with a song, the McKenzie Meets Alzheimer's Disease uh, song. And it is uh, the song is used for the lyrics of the song are the text for our picture book. Um, Begins Meets Alzheimer's Disease picture book comes with a download of the song. And um, I just, you know, wanted to give you an overall view of those are our initiatives. And um, recently I uh, contributed a chapter to the Caregiver's Advocate, a complete guide to support and resources. It's a book that's going to be coming out in July. My chapter is The Alzheimer's Conversation why and how to include children. And I, I just feel very passionate about this because of the increase in the prevalence of the disease, Alzheimer's or any type of dementia. And I would like to help break down stigmas that are going on in society and help children uh, not be fearful of those who have dementia and um, also encourage them that they might want to go into fields that deal with dementia, like, you know, occupational therapy, music therapy, even nursing, being a doctor, doing research. Um, so I am just trying to educate the next generation and uh, help families interact, have successful interactions with their loved one, um, create positive memories. That's huge in our world. We, we try to help People find joy together and to, um, you know, understand each other so that uh, I think it was Lori mentioned the word dignity. And we are all about improving the quality of life for all the family members 
as well as the person who has the disease. So we just want families to be educated and know how to create good memories. Well, and one of the things that I love about your, you know, the book, the song, the videos, all of those things, and, and this being focused on the kids, um, is I think it's so important to reach that group because a lot of times they teach the adults, you know, and that was one of the reasons I, I wrote my book, Betty the Bald Chicken, was it's a children's book. It's categorized as that, but I really think the kids are going to teach the adults because they get in passion. They see the need. They want to play. They want to engage, and they know how important that is, and to to not be afraid, to be inclusive, and as adults, we get some of those barriers built up and we don't even know that they exist. And so you guys do just a beautiful, beautiful job, you know, breaking that barrier, making it simple, making it fun, where everybody can learn together and be able to have the conversations that need to be had. There's no reason in the world we live in today and all the tools that we have for us not being able to have open conversations with people at all ages. And kids, oh my gosh, they can help out so much. And, you know, I saw that again in my own family where people like, oh no, they, they shouldn't go if it was a death, if it was someone who was ill, no, 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 they can't handle that. I don't want to upset them. They're going to bring joy. They're going to bring connection. They're going to help, you know, lift that person up and, because a lot of times they don't see the illness in the way that we see them. You know, they may have only known a parent or a grandparent maybe being sick. That's all they've known. And that's normal. And then we're like, oh, oh, it's so sad. It's so, you know, <laughs> and they're like, no, this is my grandma. I love her, you know. And I, I really learned that with my, my daughter who only knew her grandma with dementia, and uh, again, being able to have these open conversations that can happen in, in homes, in schools, in groups, um, where they can have these natural conversations that, that don't tie anybody up. And they, they have this beautiful ripple effect. So kudos to you guys. I can't wait for the new book to come out. Um, that's really exciting to do. I, re I remember when I stepped into this space back in 2009, there were very few books or even different types of medium. There was a blog here and there, and there were websites, and that was about it. And even when Facebook groups came to be, people were like, oh, you can't trust those. Those can't be real relationships. And, you know, we're busting all of those theories, but it takes all of us to come at this utilizing our passions and our skills in different ways to really make a difference. And so um, how do people get a hold of your information, Brenda? We are at, our website is mckenziemeetsalzheimers.com and we spell McKenzie, M-A-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E. And on social media, we are at McKenzie Meets Alzheimer's. And you mentioned inclusivity, and I just want to mention that our program serves hearing impaired because uh, one can order transcripts of all the videos. And also we serve the visually impaired because it's mostly auditory. So I just wanted to include that if, uh, because I think resources for those people are limited. And um, Lori, thank you for your kind words, and we so appreciate your support. And well, um, I'm happy to answer any questions of anybody. Yeah, well, you guys are you guys are doing fantastic work. Um, I think I'm going to go to the next person, but if you can stay with us, we a lot of times we'll have an open discussion towards the end and things. Sure. So um, I'm going to go up to um, Morgan next and want to hear more about Pat Summit Foundation. You know, heard a lot about it. You know, when she was first diagnosed and things, and um, you know, give us an update. What all you guys are doing. Yes. So for those who aren't familiar with women's basketball, um, you know, Pat Summit was a legendary um, women's basketball coach at the University of Tennessee. And she really built um, the program. She was very influential in college athletics um, and women's basketball and really advancing the game. Um, and she was also an Olympian that that we always focus on her eight national championships. And we forget that she was also an Olympian and an Olympic coach. Um, so she was just an incredible woman and was diagnosed with early onset dementia. 
um, in 26 or in 2011. Um, she passed away five years later, but as, I mean, just as soon after she was diagnosed, she started the Pat Summit Foundation. Um, she had, um, she made it her mission to make a difference in this disease. And so we continue her mission to this day um, to advance research and to provide support for patients and caregivers and then to promote education and awareness. Um, and over the last, I'd say about two and a half, three years, we were having a lot of conversations with caregivers and getting a lot of feedback from different individuals. And we just started noticing um that there were, they had a lot of similar questions about my loved one got a diagnosis, we were drinking from a fire hose, and now we feel like we're behind the eight ball. Um, we have just started hearing about POAs and conservatorships, and we, we didn't know that we needed those. We didn't know their importance. Now we have no idea what, how, how do we do this? Um, and so we um, worked with um, the University of Tennessee's Extension um, office, and we developed Pat's Game Plan. And it's a guide for our Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers that really focuses on their unique needs. So our hope is to kind of combat some of that mental and emotional stress that they feel when they have a loved one that's been diagnosed or as they're walking through this journey, we, we know about the health implications of our caregivers. Um, we know the real life toll this takes on them, on their own health, again, their mental and emotional health and their well-being. Um, their financial health, you know, can really be impacted. And so we just felt like if we can get them these tools and make them readily available and easily accessible, make them free of charge, um, utilize the incredible connections that we have, um, you know, we're really fortunate. You know, Pat was treated at the Mayo Clinic by um, a world-renowned physician. Um, if we can bring those connections in and make them more readily accessible, to those who are battling this disease, um, we want to do that. We want to help um, make a difference. And so we just launched that um, this past Friday, and we are um, just so incredibly um, just pleased with the, I guess, the the comments, the feedback that we're getting that this, this, really, this really was a tool that our caregivers needed. Oh, absolutely. And I think every single one of us here and every single person <laughs> listening knows that feeling of being behind the eight ball and, um, you know, just not knowing how the heck are you ever going to get in front of it. And, and we need to, we need to be able to have a comfortable conversation ahead of time. You know, we have to be able to remove that fear. And what I love is, you know, you talked about hearing from your people, you actually listened. And so often I think organizations get in their mind that we know it all and we're just going to push out what we know because we know best, you know, if we're a medical model, academic model or whatever, and that on the grounds, in the trenches kind of gets trampled over. And to me, I see there's a huge shift in the industry now of you know what, we better listen to this voice. And if we, you know, because everyone's worried about the money and, you know, from families covering expenses to, you know, our government budgets and things of how are we going to, how are we going to handle this? We have to educate them. And apparently what we're offering is not working. And so we better start listening more thoroughly. And uh, that is just such a critical, critical play. And I love the name of it, you know, Pat's, Pat's game plan. Yeah, it's, it's we, so we had to bring in that, that sports reference. Yeah, um, And, you know, I will say, I think the aspect that we weren't prepared for, we knew that, okay, we've heard from so many individuals, we're having lots of great conversations and focus groups. I think the groups that surprised me the most who were excited about this were some of our care providers, you know, um, be, talking to a clinician, talking to um, just some of our doctors at some of the different clinics that are in our area, and they said, you know, we we can't tell you how many times we get a loved one in here and we can't give them the information they need because they don't have a POA, but then I can't I can't actually make that referral for them. I can't help them get started on that path. And that was the one that really kind of tied it all together for us of 
you know, this resource can hopefully be a great tool for, for both of our care providers, but then also our caregivers. Yep. Well, and it, it's a package deal. And I think that yeah. that's been ignored for way too many years, you know, Absolutely. and it, it was all about the patient and the person diagnosed yet when you go to the doctor, they won't even look at them. They're looking at the family members and it was such a disconnect um, even from insurance and what's covered and what's not. It's like, if you don't, if you don't support that family care partner, care companion, care, you know, caregiver, whatever term you use, um, they're, they're not going to be able to provide as good of care as they deserve. And, and that causes guilt for the family member yes. too, because they know it and it, it's exhausting. So connecting, connecting people together, connecting professionals together. Um, I would hear over and over from doctors that, you know, there's nothing we can do, you know, and yet so many of the clinics had like a wall of resources that never got handed out because they didn't have time, you know, because everything is so structured and now it's on the computer and we still have to, we have to do better at connecting people to services, products, and tools. It's, it's a critical aspect. And I think, I think the community and society at large is demanding it. And I don't think they have much choice, but one of the things I also love is that both professionals and um, families are having more conversations and sharing information. I can't tell you how many families I hear from and that go in and go, I feel like I'm educating the doctors yes. because the doctors don't have time or no one told me the diagnosis could change or that we could have multiple. I mean, that's kind of a basic thing. And that is such a, that like flatlines the family if they don't know that. Um, and so, you know, there's so many having those legal things. And again, the connections um, to empower them to be able to get, um, get resources is important. I do want to mention one thing that stood out to me when Pat got her diagnosis initially. And, you know, it was all over the news. But the thing that stood out to me the most was a, a comment from her son that said, why are you surprised my mom failed this test? None of these questions are anything she's passionate about. She hates math. So of course, she's not going to be good at math. She's not going to remember the numbers. And, and I do think that that's really important because passion drives everyone, no matter who they are, no matter what their condition is. And our labels can be so damaging. And not that there's not decline, but there are still other areas that aren't being assessed and aren't being elevated that are still working. And to me, that's the critical, one of the critical pieces we have to get out to the public, that the abilities are still there, but we have to, we have to know how to identify them. We have to know that we should identify them because we're always told, well, you know, what's different, you know, and we're looking for the decline. We're not, we're not talking about what's maintained or how we can maintain it and how we can appreciate it and how we can find joy. And without that, um, that's a pretty depressing route. And then we wonder why we have caregiver burnout and people that want to commit suicide and, you know, all of those things get wrapped together. So listening to people is critically important and um, understanding that emotions, um, we can't hide them anymore. You know, we have to let people feel what they're feeling and support them through it so that they can move on. Um, through those things. And uh, again, for a, a long, long time, I know myself is like, well, I can't, I can't show that I'm frustrated. I can't show that I'm exhausted. I'm supposed to be able to handle this. You know, what will people think? And you do all that and then you're exhausted and then you just crack, <laughs> you know, and there's no hiding it. But then when you get into that position, you found there was no help either. And that's one of the cool things that's changing is people are when we have conversations like we're having today, they are learning of all the different variables that are out there to help. So Morgan, how do people get a hold of, of uh, you and your organization? Yeah, they can visit patsummit.org and summit is with two M's and two T's. Okay. Um, for the game plan, they can visit patsgameplan.org. 
Um, all of our social media information is on there. They can sign up for newsletters. They can create an account on Pat's Game Plan so they can come back and see videos and save different resources that they want to share with family or friends. Um, so we are, like I said, all over social media and things. So we're pretty pretty easy to find as long as you spell Summit right. Wonderful. Well, thank you um, thank for you. for participating today. I am going to go on to um, Amy. Amy, why don't you tell us what you are up to? You're up to a lot of different things, girl. I can't even keep no. track of you. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Lori. Well, I started a podcast called Think Dementia about a year ago, and it's been really exciting. We're in 18 different countries and territories, and I, I called it Think Dementia because I've been witness to so much love and caring as everybody goes through this dementia journey as a director of memory care and also working in home care. I've just seen families go through so many things and loving a person is just not enough. You wish it could be, right? We wouldn't have any dementia in the world. So I thought, well, we really have to to be more aware of what's happening and why they're doing the things they're doing so that we can meet them where they're at. So we have to think dementia. And it's a podcast that takes listener questions that are very practical questions. So it may be about troubleshooting overnight incontinence. It might be how to talk to your loved one about moving to a memory care. Um, You know, so many questions that uh, I will just break down and help everybody try to think dementia. And I just, it's the best part of my job as a director of memory care too, is really figuring people out and figuring out what works for them and uh, just meeting them where they are and and becoming friends with all these people living with dementia and learning little tricks on how I can help everywhere with families. Um, Families too are going through so much. And I just think that being educated about dementia is the, is the most powerful thing you can do. Oh, I agree. And I, I think you have so much knowledge because you, you have so much experience through your, your work and your personal life um, your volunteerism. I mean, it's just, and you, Amy, you really listen to people, you know, and you, and you take that to heart and you, you look for resources, you know, outside yourself as well. And um, you're so willing to share. And again, those are key, key things that I think every person who's shown up today is all about, you know, they're stepping in, they're stepping up, and they're stepping out into the world to say it, it doesn't have to be this hard. It shouldn't be this hard. And we have to break things down so it's simple to digest and process and implement. And yeah, and it's, it's about collaboration, not competition, right? Exactly. Exactly. Well, and do you want to talk a little bit about Roseville AD and, and uh, you know, the work you're doing with... Uh, with TSA and the airports, with our Roseville group? Sure, yeah. So about 10 years ago, we started the Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia Community Action Team, and Lori was part of that as well. It started with a survey in the area about what people needed, and it became a, a you know, 10-year project for a bunch of us where, you know, we are, we are, we are not even an organization. I always say we don't have a bank account. Okay, we are just people who are just hanging out once a month and figuring out what can we do to help the community learn more about dementia and resources and help them with that. We have um, usually monthly dementia caring and coping series where we have a presenter and I've presented many times with the group, but sometimes we'll have doctors or therapists in different areas. Um, I just did one on the power of a dementia support group with Roseville City Hall and um, that was really good because a lot of people think it's a real sad place and they don't know what to expect and you just don't know what you don't know until you go and start hearing from other people and and it's just really helpful and empowering I think to help others and then what spun off of that was the Dementia Friendly Airports Working Group and that was five years ago and another big project that Lori helped us start and what we finally have accomplished now, we have quite a few airports. I, there's probably 30 airports that are getting involved more and more with our dementia-friendly airports working group. We meet every other month and talk about different initiatives that are going on. And here in Minnesota, there were some really big ones that we have accomplished. Um, Sarah Barcel is our leader, and she is 
a force to be reckoned with. And she got the TSA to do a brief, like a news brief with their whole group about not separating a person living with dementia from their care partner. And that got put into law. And so that is just like a really big accomplishment of the group. We also just did a training. Um, I was one of the trainers for the Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport on Dementia Basics. We had uh, 80 to 90 people there, and they just loved the training and information they got. And I'm going back again in October to present again. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing what's been accomplished. I know um, on the site, and we'll we'll put all these links and everybody's links um, in the show notes and stuff. But um, I know Tipa Snow was part of um, doing some training videos for that. I actually have those even on my site under dementia friendly communities and. I have stuff with the uh, travel companions, you know, out there because a lot of people don't even know that that exists. And it's just absolutely incredible. And their website isn't anything fancy, but boy, it's loaded with great resources and information, you know, in terms of how to maneuver travel, things to think about um, from from noise and lighting to getting through TSA or even booking your flights, you know, (laughs) um, with layovers and all kinds of stuff, packing and stuff. So thank you for all you do. Amy, do you want to throw us a a website or two out that people can visit to, to get information on you? Sure. Yeah. I um, think dementia is think-dementia.com and you can find that podcast wherever you get your podcast. I hope you can listen because it is something that, is just really practical information. It's um, it's less scientific. It's really hands-on. Hey, what can I do about this? And I love just seeing if we can come up with a few answers for caregivers to try and just seeing them feel a little bit more empowered every time they, they try something new out and realize this doesn't have to be so, so difficult. It's going to be hard, but we can try to try to make it a little smoother. And you have a website itself too, other than just going to the podcast. What What is that? Yeah, that is www.think-dementia.com. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And I will also add in the link to Roseville AD um, uh, in the show notes. And I still think, and I, I talked to quite a few people around the world and in the country here, I still think Roseville in Minnesota is the only city that has offered space for a dementia-friendly community to post their information. And I mean, we battled that. We were told it'll never work, you know, and, and we're like, yeah, it will work because it's really a statement page that gets updated monthly, but it mm-hmm. just keeps growing with resources. And um, even the, the city manager has, and the, the fire, the police, uh, school district library has all talked about how it's impacted them being able to serve. And that's also that group launched the dementia friendly library uh initiative as well which is now international so there's there's lots of cool things when we gather together it's it's amazing what we can do collaboration exactly (laughs) exactly well sue and nancy i want to pull you two in sue i'm going to let you go first if you don't mind thank you so much laurie my heart is so filled with all of the things that so many different people are bringing toward this community, the growth and the the breadth of support that there is just really does fill my heart. My first caregiving journey began over 40 years ago, before the internet, before anybody talked about diagnoses, before anybody shared. And not surprisingly, it was pretty brutal. I say it felt like I was on an emotional roller coaster, often blindfolded. And I've been on a variety of caregiving roles over those past 40 years, including my grandmother, my dad, and my husband. And they led me to choosing to give back to others, to answer questions that I wish I had known, to talk about things I wish I had understood. I, you know, I didn't know what to know, to questions to ask. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know. I didn't know where to, to go. So I created the caregiver's journey to walk people through their entire caregiving journey from when they see it on the horizon or when it just all of a sudden begins with a diagnosis to understanding themselves in a meaningful way. We each deal with stress differently. So how do we deal with our caregiving journey? So we're not trying to live someone else's journey. We're, we're living ours the best we can. And then 
it, during that, that journey, that messy middle of the journey, what does that look like on a day in and day out basis? What are the things we go through? And then I, I, I talk about the grace of grief. We wouldn't have an emotion if it wasn't for us. And a lot of people don't, you know, they, they take on what grief means to them based on how it's been modeled by someone else instead of learning it. So it's learning to understand the emotion of grief for you. And then as you navigate it, recognizing in the last phase, which is moving forward, we're not meant to stay stuck in grief. So I created that as a foundation. And as one of the people who I've known for many years, my dear friend and former neighbor and former coworker, Nancy Treister, and I were talking last year, she's going through the journey herself and was talking about some of her frustrations and was thinking about putting together a blog post. And I said, well, one of the things I'd like to create is a podcast. Why? And she has got so much experience. I said, why don't we partner together? So we've now become partners on the caregiver's journey. And while, while I was already, as Brenda is, contributing to the Caregiver's Advocate book, which comes out, my chapter is based on something that was pivotal in my caregiving journey called Massive Acceptance and Radical Presence, something I didn't have in the beginning that changed the whole trajectory of my life. And so as the components of the caregiver's journey have become available, whether it's speaking or coaching or uh, an online course, we're, we're now putting together the the podcast. And, and Nancy, why don't you speak to that? So, uh, so Sue and I are putting together, she said, a podcast. Our focus is on uh, a bit, Amy, like you, our focus is on practical tips and candid conversations. Um, and that's because during my caregiving journey, I have my husband's uh, nine years into frontal temporal dementia and my father-in-law, who I also am the caregiver for, is about five years into Alzheimer's. So I felt like I had to do too much figuring out every single detail. I mean, little things were so frustrating and yet I've, you know, had a hard time finding uh, what, what to be prepared for next and how to handle, you know, these certain situations. And I feel like I've learned a lot and Sue has been on multiple, all of her caregiving journeys. Most of them have all been dementia oriented as well. So we decided to join forces and really try to be focused on practical tips and candid conversations. How do we help people understand how to communicate better with their care receiver, how to um, deal with incontinence, how to bathe, and also to create fewer, also to make sure they have fewer surprises. So what's coming next so that they're not only prepared to handle today, but they understand what the next step is so that they are prepared and looking for, I got this, right? I'm comfortable. I know this is coming next. And so I know how to handle that too. So uh, we have we have some pretty big um, ideas uh, where our goal is to launch uh, the beginning of August. And uh, you will see more from the caregiver's journey. In addition to what Sue already does, she's got a lot, a book, et cetera, an online course. But you'll see podcasts, blogs, uh, much broader social me media presence, et cetera. Oh, fantastic. Well, I, you know, Sue and I go back a ways. And um, it's just been fun to watch your journey and, and what you've done. And, you know, you were absolutely so gracious with your husband and sharing his story and just always so heartfelt. And you, you've always seen big pictures. I mean, I, I remember, you know, when you'd say, you know, especially during COVID, how you were writing the staff letters, you know, basically little love letters of thank you, you know, because you knew they weren't being appreciated and, and how that strengthened them as individuals feeling purposeful because everybody at every level needs to feel purposeful. I remember the picture that you sent out. I'm going to get teary eyed. And it was um, your husband and he had a card that just said, I love you because you couldn't yeah. see him during part of that period, but yeah. they worked so hard you know, yeah. to keep those connections going. And in so many places that is not in existence or it's been yeah. lost because we have really chased passionate people out of the, out of the arena because yeah. we've, we've cut that off at the knees and said, no, it's the task, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, and we, we've just overmanaged and we have to get back to, understanding the heart. Um, you know, people always ask me, you know, with my mom, for example, how, 
you know, some people don't believe she lived 30 years with dementia. That's impossible. And part of that's impossible is, no, I can't deal with it for 30 years. That's <laughs> that what most of them are, are really thinking. <laughs> but I think she lived that long because she felt connected. It was the last three years that were really tough with her. But, you know, we have to teach people that joy never leaves. It just changes you know, yeah. but that's in life with or without dementia. And we've separated it. We've made it feel different. We have to pull it back into the norm that these are stages of life that we go through. Sure. And again, we're better together. And having that practical side where people know that you've lived and breathed this process, um, you know, that that you know that one thing isn't going to be the magic bullet. And understanding that worked one day won't work the next day. And that can go from <laughs> the person with dementia to, to ourselves, yeah. you know, um, and letting go of control. Um, those are all things we've all heard, but we don't know how to implement them, especially when we're, when we're in crisis mode, it, it just gets lost. And so, you know, I love, you know, what you guys are pulling together because again, You've been there, you've done that, you understand it, and you're open to, you know, learning from your people as well. See, I think everybody on here is open to listening to what do people need, what are their true stories, and letting them be their authentic selves. And, and to me, that is so important because we're never going to get the support people need if we don't create an environment that allows them to be their authentic self and, and tell us however that is, if it's busting down, crying, if it's anger, if it's whatever, what do they need? What yeah. are they feeling? You know, um, and, and have them have permission to do it, have them feel like it's, it's safe to have permission and be vulnerable and not know. And, and that we expect that to happen. This is normal. This is, right. this is normal. You're not alone. And, you know, Amy, you were talking about, um, support groups. And even myself, I didn't want to go to a support group. To me, it was another task to do. And, you know, my audience has heard this a zillion times, but I got there by accident one time, because I was going to go listen to a colleague speak. And the nerve of him, he got sick, and he didn't show up. And then I was stuck. I was stuck in the support group that I didn't want to be in. And I didn't think I needed. And then it was like, oh my gosh, this is so different than what I thought it was. So I don't even like calling them support groups because I think there's such a stigma with them, just kind of like with the memory cafes. I, I like to call them a gathering of friends because that's really what they turn out to be, you know, that camaraderie where you can be yourself, um, you can tell your true stories. And um, this has just been such a a brilliant show today. It's been so rich and, and filled with information. Um, I want to, Nancy, was there anything else that you wanted to add? I think, I think that's good. I know, uh, I know we've shared so much. The only thing I would, I would, that I was thinking of was we, one thing Sue and I are trying to do as well is make sure that we have a place for people to find resources and all of you would be great resources for us to point to, um, as well. So look for some follow-up feedback from us. Great. Great. Um, Sue, do you want to give us um, URLs and how people find you? Absolutely. For the next, at least for another week or so, it's sueryan.solutions. I was able to get the license for the caregiversjourney.com. And we're oh, in the God. process of having our website built. When I first reached out for it, it wasn't available I reached back out and the owners of the the URL said, well, prove to me that you would be responsible with it. And I shared uh -huh. all the things I was doing and we now have that. So depending on when you watch this, give the caregiversjourney.com a try. And if not, go back to sueryan.solutions and you'll see what we have as our offerings. Wow. Talk about that's like a godsend thing, oh. you know. <laughs> <laughs> such a such a god thing it makes it so much simpler yep well and there's there's a lot of you know websites out there that are just trying to trap people you know pop up grab their names and you know i, I know even like with dementia map we don't ask for that stuff anymore because we want people to feel safe yeah. um, we want them to feel comfortable they're worried about scamming and hacking and and um you know being bothered and um 
it's, I love that name, the caregiver journey.com. That's, that's beautiful that you got Thank that. You. So congratulations. Thank you. Well, again, I just appreciate each and every one of you for what you're doing. Um, I could hear the passion in everyone's voice and the compassion uh, to back it up. And you're all doing beautiful, beautiful work and, and much needed. So thank you all for participating in Open Mic on Alzheimer's Speaks today. And right back at you, Lori, you're doing you're doing such an yeah. amazing job. Amazing, <laughs> amazing job. Thank you for all you do. Oh, thanks. And again, if you're not on Dementia Map, I'd really encourage you to, to um, sign up for that. Again, it's a way for us to be able to easily find, filter, and disseminate information in a non-threatening way. And uh, we have updated it. So um, for some of you that, that may be members, um, you can now put in videos and, and do more things in, in, the, um, in your profiles as well that can can help boost you. So again, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't wait to get this out and uh, push it out to the world. Have a great week, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Bye. everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. So great Good to night. meet you. Great to meet you. Looking forward to staying connected. Hi everyone, this is Meredith from the Senior Fitness with Meredith podcast, where I discuss all things for seniors. From fitness, your health and wellness journeys, how to be all over strong and beyond. I also have my mini podcast called Motivation with Meredith. It's a great, quick, motivational pick-me-up for your days. Join me, listen now, search for Senior Fitness with Meredith on your favorite podcast platform.